Hey guys, ECRG here, back with another episode. And as you can see by the title of this episode, we've been doing a lot of episodes on the coronavirus because, man, what a time we are living in to be able to witness, experience something like this. This is crazy. This is going to go down in history books as, you know, a crazy time. It is so crazy how this country, the USA I'm speaking of, and really the world has come to a screeching halt because of the coronavirus. Um, but the title of this episode is How Clinical Research is Going to Change Post-Coronavirus and Even During Coronavirus. And, you know, a lot of people have been watching this series, listening to this series, uh, whether it be on the podcast or YouTube, and, you know, kind of been kind of talking about this current state of the union and what's been going on in clinical research. So I'm going to start off with that, and then we're going to get into uh, what's been going on, what I think will happen in the future. So for the longest time... Uh, sites have been 100% SDV. Monitoring has been 100% SDV. And then for the past few years, you've been hearing this um, talk of risk-based monitoring, uh, remote monitoring, and doing more things that can be done remotely. And um, we're seeing where people that have shifted to that early are having less of an impact right now because of the coronavirus. Um, and I think this is going to force more people more, more sites, more um, sponsors, more CROs uh, to rush more towards the remote monitoring, risk-based monitoring model just in case something like this in the future would happen. Uh, coronavirus, any type of um, thing that could shut the economy down. Um, but really, it's, it's showing that sites, CROs, and sponsors can work together in a remote possibility that we are capable because for so long, the old guard in the industry, and this industry tends to be pretty uh, conservative and move slowly. The old guard in the industry were hesitant, are hesitant to try new things. And when risk-based monitoring or remote monitoring really came about, um, it's a new thing, obviously, and it's really reliant on technology. So obviously, people are hesitant to try the new thing because what if it doesn't work? Um, I know the the old way, you know, going on site. 100% of the time works for sure. So why would we try something new that may or may not work when we know uh, this old way works for sure? Um, and it just so happens um, that when coronavirus hit, um, you know, there's a need now to have this remote infrastructure. And, you know, for a lot of studies, the remote way of monitoring and, you know, just the remote, uh, even handling patient visits remotely is not written into the protocol what to do in that situation. So I think one, first of all, there's going to be, uh, it's going to be implemented into the protocol, these contingencies for if things need to go to remote, it's going to be written in the protocol. Um, and there's going to be SOPs around it too at the CRO and sponsor level, um, because this is just having that big of an impact. Um, this is something that's going to last months. We're in the thick of it right now. I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, but you know, I, I typically monitor along the East Coast, Northeast Coast of America, and New York City is just getting absolutely bombarded right now. Um, I have a number of sites in the New York City area, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, uh, those boroughs specifically, and they're just getting obliterated right now. Now, a part of that is because of the way New York City set up, a huge emphasis on public transportation, which is good in most sense, in normal senses. Um, people packed up on top of each other all the time. So, you know, people are just constantly spreading the virus to each other uh, based on those logistical parameters. Um, so, yeah, they're getting absolutely bombarded right now and it's forcing um, us to think about what's going to happen in the future. Um, yeah, so, I mean, New York City, they're in the thick of it. I think this is going to happen across the country, but it seems like more places across the country are you know, planning for it. They know it can happen. Um, so let's hope that, you know, they prepare as best they can Two, another thing is, you know, with global warming, I hate to bring that up into this too, but, um, apparently vi these type of viruses do worse when it gets warmer. So I know that, uh, coming up this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, um, March 28th and 29th, uh, it's supposed to get a lot warmer. So hopefully that does a lot to quell, the um, virus um, a lot and prevent people from getting it as long as people continuing to do social distancing and self quarantining and all that. And I hope that um, people don't get 
you know, um, what do you say? Like they feel like they're winning early, kind of like when someone, you know, catches a touchdown pass and they start gloating early and then they get tackled before they actually get to the touchdown or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen. You know, we see a lot of success early, but because we, we got to finish it, we don't want to see it uh, like they did in Hong Kong where they let people get back to normal life. And then there's a huge spike again. So they got to go back to quarantine. So we hopefully, you know, we, we get it one and done. We do it right the first time. So we don't have to go back and do it again. Um, so hopefully that's the case. Um, but, you know, it's just a crazy time we're living in right now. And I think, you know, the first thing we're going to see is this implemented into protocols, these, these type of things. Um, second thing we're going to see is companies actually um, prefer a remote based approach to begin with to where, you know, if something like this were to happen, there wouldn't be a huge change other than like the not be able to travel part. So I think we're going to start seeing that in actual uh, protocols, the way they're written is going to be have a more remote component um, that way, studies can still be monitored. Um, I think also the way IP is shipped, um, there might be a change with that also having going directly to patients' houses as opposed to, you know, through the, through the pharmacy and stuff, maybe some kind of different IP accountability. Uh, because what happens if the person handling the, the drug were to get uh, corona, this coronavirus? Um, you don't want that going to your patients or interacting with the PI. You don't want to infect the whole site. Um, so I think we might see some see some changes there. Uh, we're already seeing those changes in the midst of the crisis um, where, you know, this whole thing can just be an absolute mess if the right people end up with coronavirus and have to self-quarantine. Um, so I know I know we're already seeing that uh, in the midst of this crisis. Um, some other things that, that might change, you know, I've already talked about the uh, more emphasis on remote work, um, but I think it's going to potentially, you know, increase the people to work from home. Like I said before, part of the, the reason why people are hesitant to have people work from home mostly, or people are hesitant to, um, you know, do all these remote visits and things of that nature were because they thought they didn't know it would work and they know what they were doing now does work. Well, now we're in a situation where we're forced to have people work from home, forced to do these remote visits and forced to um, do everything you know, with people being separate and forced to use these technologies, email, phone, Skype, Zoom, whatever you, you want to call it, forced to use these technologies that keep people apart and keep people safe. So, you know, I think people are going to realize that you can't actually conduct studies this way. You can't actually conduct business this way. And they're going to do that moving forward. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how many companies implement a work from home policy after this. Um, because they realize, you know, we can actually be successful without having to come into an office. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how many, um, you know, sites may even implement a work from home policy or just change policies to allow people easier access to work remotely. Because clearly it's much needed. Um, if more people were working from home, I'm sure this crisis would not uh, be so bad. Um, and I think there's a lot of other benefits to society, too, if more people are working from home. Um, i.e., you know, limited rush hour, um, you know, just different things like that, limited pollution, limited traffic, things of that nature. Um, but that's a different topic for another day. Um, so that's another thing. Um, another thing about the coronavirus, COVID, how this is going to affect things is if you're trying to find a job right now in clinical research, um, you still see the job postings coming up. But I can't imagine anyone is hiring right now, especially a CRO. Um, you know, depending on how bad this gets, I'm really, really hopeful, crossing my fingers, that the warm weather coming soon puts a big dent in the coronavirus and gives us some hope because, um, you know, it's been, sh it's been shown and I've watched a lot of stuff on this, did a research that, um, warm or humid environments decreases the spread of the viruses because the respiratory droplets can't travel as far. And then if it's nice and sunny, the UV, uh, rays from those droplets, um, the UV rays can actually damage those DNA and RNA particles, uh, strands from the virus. So it's actually really, really helpful, um, for it to be warmer and getting warm at the right time. Um, so hopefully that does, I'm really, really hopeful for that to put a dent in the coronavirus and how fast it's spreading around the country and things of that nature. Um, 
But I think if this goes on another month or so, well, I guess I said that, you know, a week ago, I guess another two to three weeks, um, I think there are definitely going to be some layoffs. Um, cause you know, if, if people can't travel, especially monitors, I think that's going to be the first thing to go. That's always the first people to go because if they can't travel, then CROs can't bill for them. Um, you know, unless I haven't heard of them making any promises that they're not laying off any CRAs, et cetera. Um, but that's the one job that requires travel. Um, it, it is, it is a part of the job and if they can't travel, they can't bill for those hours. And that's how us CROs make a lot of money. CROs probably make some of their biggest. I mean, a lot of them, you know, a CRO is just like a one-stop shop for different services. They offer project management, data management, monitoring, you know, different, different sponsors want different aspects from the CRO. You, that's why you see different, different, um, you know, different things set up in their, in their bids. Some of them, they just want monitoring. So the CRO will provide them a few monitors, um, that they have trained. Um, sometimes sponsors just want the project management, then they'll do that. Sometimes they just want the data management. So then they'll set that up. Um, but different sponsors want different things. And so that's why these big trials, you know, they have everything, the project manager, the data management, um, you know, the monitoring, and then that's when it gets really expensive. Um, but the, obviously the data manager can still work as long as the, as long as there's data to, to manage project manager can still work. Um, they don't require that much travel. They can do that from home. Most of them do work from home, but the monitor is the one thing that keeps it all going because as long as there's, there's data being collected, the monitor reviews it. Um, if the monitor hasn't reviewed any data, then the data manager can't work because, you know, there's no data for them to manage. There's no big data for them to manage. So it really kind of starts and stops with the CRA. And like I said before, a lot of companies aren't just going to want to have that, those huge salaries um, on their payroll when they can't, when they aren't being able to get the most of them. So I think you should really look out for the CRAs right now, Um, especially those contractors. Uh, Those will probably be the first to go. Um, Because, for those of you that have worked in a CRO, you know what it's like having to submit that uh, worksheet, that uh, timesheet every week. And you know, if there's a few hours too much on, you know, if you're billing it to overhead, if you're billing it to, you know, um, training or anything else that is not billable to the sponsor, if you are billing a little too much, you know you're getting a phone call from your man- manager about that. So imagine this time where everything is being billed to um, is being billed to the CRO and, um, that's, that's gonna be problematic. That's gonna be really, really problematic. So, I mean, obviously when the economy gets going again and clinical research gets growing and going again, um, you know, CROs are going to be hired in abundance. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, but it's just during this time, if they're going to want to hold that dead weight. And I think that's the big question. But there's no doubt about it that after this passes, the coronavirus passes, CROs are going to be in very high demand again. CRAs are going to be in very high demand again. And I'm sure the, the uh, clinical research economy will come back and do just fine how it was doing before. Um, it's just during this time that's of question. So, um, yeah, a lot of changes happening because of the coronavirus. And I think we'll see, we'll see hopefully we'll see changes at the federal level where we are more prepared for these pandemics to happen. Um, cause it's, it's just a shame how unprepared the USA is, uh, when it comes to battling this, you know, not enough ventilators, uh, short on hospital staff, not enough masks, not enough tests. Um, you know, these things should have been done as soon as we heard the first, um, cases coming out of China. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's that. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are going to be affected by this a lot more are going to be affected by this than possibly should have, um, as soon as those first cases started coming over, perhaps we should have banned international travel immediately to stop the spread of the cases and to stop the influx of the cases, um, you know, just to prevent it. Another thing is the misinformation out there around the coronavirus. Um, at first, it was being branded as just an old person's disease, people with conditions. But this is very, this is very, very deadly and is very, very effective. If you go and listen to other people's stories, Slim Thug, um, rapper Slim Thug, um, he's talking about how uh, painful it was. You're talking about um, Scarface, who had, you know, a rapper from uh, Houston. He had, you know, uh, other comorbidities also, but he said he thought he was going to die. 
And these aren't old people necessarily in their 40s and in early 50s, the, where before they were reporting, you know, 65 plus need to be worried about it. Um, I've heard stories of young people, people in their 20s and 30s getting it, thinking that they were going to die, how painful it was. Um, so everyone needs to be really, really careful with this coronavirus and definitely needs to uh, self-quarantine, social distance as much as possible, and just just not really pass on the virus if you get it. Um, so we will see what happens. But clinical research is definitely going to be changed uh, by this coronavirus. And I think we're going to see more remote work in the future, more, um, more um, t- lenience on technology to do things in the future, just so if another one of these were to happen in the future, um, we'd be prepared for it or any type of um, thing where we're not going to be able to travel or be in person. So uh, I'm going to update you guys as we continue to uh, get more information about the coronavirus. Oh, and by the way, I did mention, in, I think this in my last video on coronavirus, in my last episode, um, but pretty much all remote, all monitoring has been canceled, on-site monitoring. Um, patients have refused, are pretty much refusing to come on site. Um, so you know, data collection is going to be difficult during this time. So that's another thing that I think will be in the protocol is how to collect certain data points, even though, um, even though they're not coming into site. So I think that's going to be interesting. Um, I think that's going to be interesting when, um, you know, this clinical trials comes back on. So what data points are mandatory? Um, what data points are not mandatory or what data points can the patient collect on themselves, what kind of technology do we have for that um, to kind of limit their on-site uh, exposure in the event of a pandemic, or just to limit it in general, to limit the you know the expense of the trial um, in general. Um, so we'll see all these things, all these thoughts. We'll see what kind of forward-thinking ideas people have. Um, I think ACRP, um, I think they canceled it for 2020, but 2021. Could be really interesting. I think we'll see a lot of coronavirus data points and see what people are um, going to be saying about doing conducting clinical trials in this post coronavirus world. Um, so definitely, I would make sure if you can um, listen to some talks from that or any type of clinical research conference or information. Um, of course, I'm going to continue to uh, give you guys the information as I can um, and kind of what uh, things I see happening in the future in clinical research as we go. So thank you guys for listening. Um, If you have any questions about this episode or any questions about anything in the future uh, regarding your resume reviews or getting into clinical research, email me, eliteclinicalgroup at gmail.com. Take care.